can you send me a 1099 showing the total amount that you paid me last year for the services I provided? Wait, what? Huh? Is that something I'm supposed to do? Is that a tax form? How many people am I supposed to send that to? Am I late? Oh no, I think I've missed something. Okay, don't worry. I am not going to stop working in accounting to become an actor because I know that I am not that good at it. But have you ever received a text or an email or something similar with kind of a similar message that I just acted out that I received from somebody and you immediately kind of get fear or maybe you see a video like this or an Instagram post or a blog post talking about 1099s for your contractors and you immediately just have kind of a pit in your stomach because you know that you're supposed to do something, you've heard about that before, but the whole year has gone by and you haven't done anything with it yet. That's okay because I'm here to talk to you today all about 1099s and I'm going to go over who needs a 1099, what type of businesses and what businesses should be distributing 1099s. And then if you are a freelancer or a contractor, I'm going to talk a little bit about what 1099s you should be receiving and who you should receive them from. So hang in there and we'll get right to it. Hi there, I'm Stephanie Thacker and I'm the founder and CEO of Steadfast Bookkeeping Company, which is a full service done for you bookkeeping and tax firm. And I'm here to simplify all things bookkeeping and tax for your small business. All right, let's go ahead and dive in. First, I want to answer the question, what is a 1099 form? You know that it's a tax form, you know that it somehow is reporting wages, but you're not sure exactly what it is. So let's go ahead and talk about that. A 1099 form is used to report wages that were paid to a freelancer or a contractor. Now this can be an individual or this could even be a business that is operating as a sole proprietor or maybe an LLC. You can actually on these forms even report monies that were paid to landlords or to attorneys. You can even report things like royalties that were paid to individuals or businesses um, based on wages that are not going to show up on a W-2 form, which is your employee wages. So any wages or earnings that were paid or that you received, this is the form that they're going to show up on. Now, prior to 2020, the most common 1099 form was the 1099 miscellaneous form. This form is what we would use to report those wages or those earnings that were paid. And the most common box that we would use is box number seven, which was non-employee compensation. So this is where you would put the funds that were paid, again, to an individual or a small business. And this could be for things like maybe a marketing manager, a social media manager, a virtual assistant, the list could go on. Services that you are paying for where that individual is not an actual employee of your business, but you did pay them wages for services rendered. That is what we would use that form for. Now the 1099 miscellaneous form still exists today in 2020, but as of this year, some changes have been made and box seven is no longer used for non-employee compensation. Now a 1099 miscellaneous form is most commonly going to be used for rents that were paid or um, monies that were paid to an attorney or royalties or things like that. Now a non-employee compensation wage would need to be reported on a 1099 NEC. And if you guessed that NEC stands for non-employee compensation, then you're right, you're the winner, you got it. So now we use form 1099 NEC to report those wages that were paid or earned for non-employee compensation. So again, just think about services that were rendered for, um, an individual or a business that it's not on your actual payroll. I'm going to go ahead and go over to my screen now and just show you an actual 1099 miscellaneous form and an, a 1099 NEC form and show you what those look like and where you would report those wages. Okay, so here is a 1099 miscellaneous form. Now, like I said, these forms were the most common forms prior to 2020 and they have not completely 
completely gone away, you are definitely still going to see and possibly need to use or receive this form. So let's go ahead and take a look at it. Now, again, if you are using a software, you'll just have all of that information input and it will actually generate these forms for you. However, if you are going to be using something like this where it's a fillable PDF, or you're going to be handwriting them or printing them off, then these are the things that you need to know about this form. Now in the top left-hand corner, you just simply enter the payer's information. That is your information. You'll want to enter your business name, address, and all of that. Underneath that, you'll want to enter your tax ID number. So again, this is going to be your EIN or your social security, however you are operating your business. Um, if it's through your social security, you enter that, or if you have an EIN, then you enter that number there. Next to that is the recipient's tax ID number. So this is whoever you paid. So again, you will have received that W-9 form from them, hopefully, with all of this information. So you'll just check that W-9 form. It will let you know. It will have that tax ID number, and you just go ahead and put that in here. And then below that, you're simply going to put in their name, again, however they have it listed on their W-9, followed by their address. Okay, then over here on the right hand side, let's talk about some of these boxes. So the most common ones now for the 1099 miscellaneous is probably going to be box number one. So if you are paying rent for, you know, let's say a studio or a shop or an office or anything like that, you want to probably go ahead and ask your landlord for W-9. If they are not operating as a corporation, then you will want to go ahead and submit a 1099 miscellaneous to them. And you'll want to input the amount here that you paid them for rent in any given year. Let's say you paid $1,000 a month for your studio. You would want to enter $12,000 there. So that's going to be a very common um, reason to use this 1099 miscellaneous form. You can also see that box number two is for royalties. That could be another um, common one that you would use there. And also I want to point your attention to box number 10, gross proceeds paid to an attorney. Now I didn't touch on this before, so I want to touch on it now because attorneys are a little bit different. Now let's say that you've paid an attorney to handle some legal matters for you this year or from the previous year. If that was the case, you will want to submit a 1099 miscellaneous form to them, whether they are a corporation or not. So you would want to go ahead and collect a W-9 from them. That way you have all of their information. But even if they say that they're an S-Corp or a C-Corp, whatever box they check on the W-9, you would still want to submit a 1099 miscellaneous form to them. So if this uh, 1099 was actually going to be for an attorney, and let's say that you know maybe you paid an attorney, I don't know, $5,000 to do some work for you, you would input that right there, and then you would submit this 1099 miscellaneous form to them. Remember, regardless of whether they are an individual, a sole proprietor, or some type of corporation, that's really almost the only instance that that is going to happen. And if you pull a 1099 miscellaneous form up online like I have, and you kind of read the instructions, it will point that out to you and tell you that, you know, box number 10 needs to be completed, whether they are a corporation or not. So that's pretty much it for the 1099 miscellaneous form. So let's take a look at this new 1099 NEC form. Okay, so just by looking at this form, you can see it's a little bit smaller than the 1099 miscellaneous. Again, this is the 1099 NEC, and this form is only used for non-employee compensation. So this is not for rent, it is not for your landlords, it's not for attorneys, it is not for royalties that were paid, things like that. This is for non-employee compensation. Any contractor, freelancer, or small business that you paid to do a service for you, this is the form you are going to use. This form is very simple, just like with the 1099 miscellaneous form. This can be done in an automated software. So if you've input that information, it will actually complete this form for you. However, again, if you're printing this, using the fillable PDF, handwriting it, whatever you're doing, this is what the form looks like. 
It is very similar and very simple. You over here in the top left hand corner will just enter your information. This is the payer's name, address, things like that. You'll want to make sure that this matches your tax records. And then you'll want to put in the payer's tax identification number. That is either your EIN or your social security number, however you're operating your business. And then next to that, you'll simply enter the recipient's tax identification number. So whoever is receiving this form, that is where you would put in their number. Again, remember you're getting this information from their W-9 form that you submitted to them. So it should have all of that for you. Then you'll just enter their name as they've entered it or they've put it on their W-9, their address. And then over here on the right hand side, box number one is really the one that's going to be the most common and if you're watching this video probably very likely this is what you're the form that you're going to use and this is the box that you will be using so remember i gave examples of maybe a um virtual assistant or an accountant or a bookkeeper marketing manager social media manager the list can really just go on and on but if you paid a contractor a freelancer or a small business this is where you would put it so let's go back to the example of the va and let's say you paid a va i don't know 500 dollars a month and that was all done with a check then you would just input six thousand dollars paid for the year so you would simply enter that six thousand dollars right there and that is literally all you have to do beyond entering in your information and their information you just input box number one and then it's ready to go so that is the non-employee compensation form and that will be effective in 2020. Okay, so now that you've seen what those two forms look like and we've talked about that a little bit more, let's talk about a couple of other things that are really useful for you to know about 1099 forms. Now, other than the fact that you don't need to distribute a 1099 to corporations, so anybody that gives you a W-9 and lets you know that they are some type of corporation, whether that's an S-corp or a C-corp or anything like that, there are also some other times where you actually don't need to distribute a 1099 form. So let's go ahead and talk about that. It's very common in these days to pay your contractors with a credit card or maybe a PayPal transfer or something like that. And in those cases where you're making payments with a third party payment processor, you actually do not need to distribute a 1099 to that individual or that small business. And the reason for that is that the IRS says that if you're using a third party payment processor, it actually becomes the responsibility of the third party to distribute those 1099 forms. And at that point, the third party payment processor actually distributes a form that's called a 1099K. So let's say that you have a virtual assistant that you're paying, and maybe they send you an invoice through PayPal every month, and you pay that invoice through PayPal. For that individual or that small business, you actually would not need to distribute a 1099 to them because the responsibility would then be put on PayPal to submit that 1099K to that individual or small business. Or maybe let's say you are paying a social media manager and they are sending you an invoice through QuickBooks every month and when you click on the invoice to pay that, you pay with your credit card. You don't need to submit a 1099 to them because you are using a credit card, Visa, MasterCard, American Express, whatever that is, that's considered a third party payment processor. So you do not need to issue your own 1099 NEC to them. Again, it's going to be the responsibility of the third party payment processor. Now let's talk about a couple scenarios that you might hear about or that might come up. So let's say that you have been paying those invoices via QuickBooks with a credit card or PayPal, and you don't submit that 1099, but you still get that text saying, hey, can you give me a 1099 and show the total of what you paid me this past year? In that case, and that happens a lot, you could tell them, you know, well, I paid you through PayPal or I used my credit card, so I actually don't have that responsibility to pay or to send you or to distribute that 1099. 
And they might come back and say, well, I didn't get anything from PayPal or I didn't get anything from the credit card company. And the reason for that is that these third party payment processors actually have policies in place and they have kind of regulations set by the IRS that say they don't have to distribute those 1099 forms if they are under a certain amount. So that might be $20,000. And at that point, if you let's say you've only paid that person $5,000 for the year, you don't necessarily have to submit a 1099 to them and neither does PayPal because it's under that threshold. So in that case, I would say, you know, if they need to know the amount, you can certainly give it to them, but it's okay that you are not distributing a 1099 to them. And it's okay that PayPal isn't, you're both following the regulations. Now that's something very common that we see and my biggest recommendation there is, of course, for both of you to be keeping up with your bookkeeping. That way you can easily pull up your bookkeeping. You can see how much you paid them and you can say, just in case you needed to know for your records, I paid you $5,000 last year. Or they could easily look it up in their bookkeeping and see, oh, they paid me $5,000 and so I can make sure that I'm accounting for that on my taxes. Now, one thing that you wanna remember is to stay consistent with the way that you are paying your contractors, okay? Stop and think about it. If you've been paying that virtual assistant, we'll just go back to that example. If you've been paying that virtual assistant all throughout the year, and maybe in the beginning of the year, you were cutting a check, whether you were handwriting a check and giving it to them, or maybe you were going on your bank and using bill pay or something like that. But let's say that you were using a method where money was just coming directly from your bank account into theirs. And then the rest of the year, you started using PayPal. Maybe sometimes you use a credit card. Then when it comes time to distribute that 1099, you're gonna be kind of confused and start thinking, wait, so what do I even put on the 1099? Because Half of the year I did pay them directly and so I need to put that, but then sometimes I paid with my credit card or PayPal, so do I just put it all on there or do I only put some of it? And so you don't wanna come into that confusion. Um, you don't wanna to have to make that decision. So my biggest recommendation there would just be, you know, be consistent with how you're paying them. If they're not sending you an invoice where you're clicking and paying and it's up to you to initiate that payment every time, then just try to be consistent in that. You can rest assured that you are not going to be doubling the income that you're telling the IRS that you paid them, and they're not going to come you know, into any trouble with that either. So if you paid 5,000 in credit card and 5,000 a direct bank transfer, you could honestly put $10,000 on there and still be okay. Just know that if for some reason that contractor does receive a 1099 from you know paypal or whoever it is they want to be very careful and make sure that they're you know accounting in the right way so they'll want to you know make sure that it's not too much being reported now one way that we really like to keep track of the 1099 contractors being paid throughout the year is to just use our accounting and bookkeeping software that we use all of the time and love, which is QuickBooks Online. So in QuickBooks Online, every time you pay a contractor, you can put that payment into QuickBooks and you can actually mark them as a 1099 contractor. When you do that, it's going to keep track of every payment that you've paid them throughout the year. So go ahead and check out that link for QuickBooks below. Um, if you haven't tried using QuickBooks Online or you haven't tried a software like that, go ahead and test it out. See if you like it. A big bonus is that it's not only used for your 1099s and it won't just help you with that, which will be an amazing help for the next year, but you can also do all of your bookkeeping in it and it's super user-friendly and easy to use. A really great option to start your bookkeeping process. Okay, now what about if you are the contractor or the freelancer and you're thinking, okay, when should I expect this or what should I expect? Basically, the answer to that is if you are an individual or you are a small business operating as a sole proprietor or an LLC, then you should be receiving 1099 forms from the businesses that you completed work for. So if they paid you with a bank transfer or a check or something like that, that we've talked about even cash, then you would be receiving a 1099 form from them. The most common one, again, is probably going to be that 1099 
in EC. So you would want to make sure that you receive that form from them. Now, the best way to ensure that you are going to receive that form is go ahead and provide them with a W-9 form. That's going to have all of the information that they need. It's going to give them your name, your address, and your tax ID number, whether you have an EIN for your business or whether you operate off of your social security number. It's going to give them all of the information they need because they're going to need that information to put on your 1099 form. So supplying them with that is going to be a big help in ensuring that you get that form. Now let's talk about some due dates, and this applies to anybody. For the 1099 forms, you need to distribute those by the end of January of any given year. So January 31st of any given year, those forms are due to the individual or the small businesses. So if you are the business that is distributing them, you wanna make sure that you do that by January 31st, or if you are the contractor or freelancer that's looking for them to be distributed to you, then you should be looking for those to arrive by January 31st. Then if you don't e-file and you're maybe using paper forms or something like that, you actually have until March 31st to submit those forms to the IRS. However, if you're using a system like QuickBooks, like I recommended, they're going to e-file everything for you and it's just all going to go at one time, which is really great. You don't have to worry about it. But I did want to put that date out there that if you did do paper forms or things like that, the forms that you need to file with the IRS would be due by March 31st of any given year. All right, I hope that information was helpful. I hope it clarified a few things about 1099s for you. If not, definitely drop a comment and a question um, down below and I will be happy to answer it. And definitely check out the link as well for our services. If 1099s is just something that intimidates you or you just don't even wanna deal with it, definitely check out our website, take a look at our services. Maybe our bookkeeping or tax services is something that will help you, and we'd love to help you with your 1099s as well. Also, don't forget to subscribe to my channel because I release new videos like this each and every week, so I will see you there next time.